Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Um, are dismissed. You can turn to Mark chapter 7 this morning. I um, wanted to just briefly talk to you about some family business. Um, you know, it's, it's been kind of a journey over the last 11 years. We, as a church, have come a long way. How do you guys like to, what the building looks like out there? Yeah. Um, um, excited to see what God is doing and just... Um, you know, progress that he's making, um, just in all of us, and you know, and, and over the last over the last eleven years, you know, we've been um, on this journey together. You know, I've seen the Lord do just amazing things in my life personally and in His church as well, um, in, in terms of provision and things that He's done for us. And um, you know, we've always um, just kind of trusted the Lord through the whole thing, and He and He's always provided and. And you know, same with, with even in our life, you know, just even recently, um, this last couple weeks has been kind of a ride for us because my wife wanted to look at this house that there was no way we could ever buy this thing. I mean, it was way beyond realistic for for us, I mean, for what we deserve or um, otherwise. And um, so she took me to look at this house, and I was thinking, oh, we're wasting the realtor's time and everything, but oh well, you know, just got to satisfy your wife. And, Anyway, um, just being honest, but anyway, so God, like, just started, this weird thing started happening, and, you know, we, we got approved for enough, and she's like, we got to get approved for credit, so I humored her, and we got approved for enough, and I was thinking, you know, but you don't want to be right at the edge of what you can, you know, afford, you know, you never want to borrow what you can afford, you know, and so, um, you know, things are just kind of working out, and um, then the day that, you know, that we were thinking about, you know, seriously consider, I was starting to seriously consider, I made Shannon get, I was going to sleep that night, because she's like thinking seriously about it, so we've got to get up and crunch the numbers. We got up and crunched the numbers, and we could do it. And I was like, hmm. Well, then the bank said, you know, called the realtor and said, hey, we're dropping the price $25,000 on that house you're looking at. <laughs> so I was just like, whoa. So we put an offer in, they accepted us by the next morning. It was crazy. None of that should have happened. Um, but anyway, so it's my wife's dream house, so praise the Lord for that. But, um, you know, it, that's the way that we've operated, you know, I mean, we've needed cars, we've prayed, you know, the Lord's provided cars, all this stuff, and same with the church, we've all done all that stuff. Um, and that's the way we've operated, I mean, so far, we've built this building, we've built that building, I have never, ever, and, and, and never would have said, hey, you know, everybody needs to contribute. It just isn't in my DNA as a pastor. It just never has been. Um, but this last week I was um, the but this last week I was uh, I was praying about it and you know thinking about well we got to build this building out here we got to add on to this because we need bathrooms out here and things like that and I, I got I got three requests for benevolence and I was a little bit troubled by it because you know budgets always been tight you know we're always um, you know we have enough but we always are right there so every time somebody says hey. You know, and, and my buddy Brent in Rome, the one we support every month, he uh, he emailed me and said, hey, you know, we're in a downfall or a shortfall right now and we really need some help. And to be honest with you, having operated the way that we always operate, I was kind of like, well, just trust the Lord, you know. You don't have to say, hey, we need money. And the Lord just kind of convicted me about that. Well, I, re I read my email later on and the Lord provided for their need. But miraculously, before he even sent the email to me, the Lord has provided for the need. And, you know, I was, just, I was thinking about, you know, we need to build this building, but I don't want to borrow any more money to, to build this building out here. And, um, you know, we still need to put a roof on the building over there and just all these things. And we have enough money that we can borrow to do that. Um, and so I was just praying, you know, I was kind of struggling with that and, and praying about that. And I came in and I talked to Jesse. And he's like, well, maybe you should talk to the body about it. And I, I was like, ah, I don't know. I just don't do that. And then I got in my car and I turned it on and it was Pastor Bob, my nice pastor. And he was talking to his body about the exact same thing. I was like, no. <laughs> and so, um, and really what struck me about what Bob was saying, you know, and, and this is the other part of it. Um, I'm, I think I'm communicating this better than I, than I did last service. Last service, I just kind of tripped all over myself. But um, what, what really hit me about it was Bob was saying, you know, we got our kids out in the tent. 
And it's just really not loving to have them out there. You know, we need to, you know, we, we give, not only because we love God, you know, these are our motivations to love God and because we love one another. And um, I talked to like three different people over the last couple of months who said they weren't coming to church because it's too far away from the bathrooms to be out here. And, you know, and other people say, you know, well, we, we don't, there's no bathrooms close by and there really need to be close by a bathroom. So I, I don't want to come until that other part's done. And so... Anyway, um, I'm not saying we're a shortfall or anything like that. That's not the case. But, you know, I just wanted to put out to you guys, let you know. Um, so far, and you know, normally we don't do this, but I'm going to tell you what everything costs, just so you know. <coughs> so far, what we're putting into that building, I think total all said, once we get the roof on and everything, will be about $50,000 to remodel the front of that building. We probably need to do a little bit more in the nursery. Um, we need to do some stuff to the bathrooms over there. I don't know how much that will cost. Um, and, but then this addition... Anywhere from fifty to one hundred thousand dollars, and I'll figure that out. What that's going to cost, but you know, so far the Lord's provided, and um, you know, just you know, I know that not everybody has the means to give extra or to you know to give at all. You know, and, and I think that the, the reality is, as a body, we just need to love each other. So there's no pressure on anybody, but let's love one another and let's pray for God to provide, which He has miraculously. We bought this whole building for what's it, forty-five thousand dollars. I mean, it's, it's always been a miracle. But I just want to give you guys the opportunity um, to, you know, contribute. You know, we've had certain people, like individuals, contribute more than anybody. Um, you know, and, and I think that that's great. You know, and I think that, um, you know, all of us can do a little bit. You know, if it's just praying or coming and helping paint, which 20 people did yesterday. As you saw, the building was a different color when we got here this morning. So, exciting stuff. Just uh, just wanted to give you that news flash. We'll probably be posting in the bulletin... Um, kind of what our hopes are. I'm not going to put a thermometer on the stage and we're not going to beg, okay? So don't worry about that. Because, you know, this is the Lord's building, you know. If he wants that to come up, the money's going to come in. If he doesn't, then, you know, we'll just keep praying. But um, anyway, that's that. That's one of the hardest things I just ever did. All right, let's move on. Mark chapter 7. Mark chapter 7. And this is negotiating with God. This is one of the things I did when God was kind of putting on my heart to talk about this because I have I never wanted to have to do that. But negotiating with God is the topic of our message. And I don't know about you, but when I go buy something, um, especially if it's on Craigslist or if it's at a yard sale, it's time for negotiations. I will talk that person down to the last possible penny, right? And that's just the way that I am. I, I'm, it's, it's, part of the, it, it's part of the fun, right, of buying something. My wife is not like that. I will embarrass her. She'll be like, I'm waiting in the car. I'm not going to be around when you talk that person down. You know, because I'm just part of the game. Um, she, on the other hand, is the opposite. She will pay more for an item at a yard sale if she thinks it's underpriced. And I've seen her do this. She actually has given the person, you need, you know, that's worth more than that. I can't. I'm like, hello, you know. But, you know, opposites attract. And so, um, I, I don't care who you are. I think that every single one of us, no matter if you're the person who's not going to negotiate ever, or you're the person who loves to get a bargain, I think every single one of us, at one time or another, finds ourselves negotiating with God. And whether that's, you know, it's, I guess you kind of like a kid in a shopping cart, you know, getting ready to go into the grocery store, they put on that negotiator's hat, like how can I get candy out of my parents when, you know, or that teenager who has something important they need for school and they know it's going to be expensive and so they put on that negotiator's hat and they you know, try to warm up their parents. Oh, you look lovely today, Mom. You know, or whatever they do to try to butter their parents up for the, the thing you know, that they're going to ask for. And I think that the reality is, is that there's always that time when we're going to um, find ourselves negotiating with God because we see He has something that we need or we see that he can supply. And, and whether it's right or not, um, I guess that remains to be seen. In this case, in this chapter today, is that we are going to see a woman who is pretty much negotiating with God, but um, I, I think that there's a wrong way and a right way to do it. <clears throat> see, I, I think a lot of times, you know, maybe some of the things we negotiate for are, you know, instant things like, God, help me pass this test, or, you know, maybe long-term things like, 
God, just help me to find a wife or help me to find a husband or just things like that, you know. And, and if you do this for me, Lord, if you, help me, if you help me just to pick the right lottery numbers, Lord, I'll give half to the church. And we always have our, our negotiation. Or, or I, I, I promise I will never ask for anything again. How many of you guys have done that? Lord, if you answer this prayer, I'll never ask for anything again. You know, because we're desperate sometimes. You know, hopefully God never answers that prayer because, you know, then we're kind of stuck, right? I don't think he does answer that prayer because I think he wants us to ask him. But the, the problem is, is that um, God, I, I just don't think that God really cares so much about what I have to offer him. Maybe we're praying for something a little bit more serious, like, God, please spare my child. I don't know if you've ever been in that place where your child is sick, really sick, and you've prayed that prayer, God, just let me be sick instead of them. Or God, spare my life. And you get that test result back from the doctor. Lord, if, if, you, if you spare my life, I'll, I'll, I'll follow you. I'll do anything. And we negotiate our promises to God. I'll never do that again. Or I'll always do this. Or from now on, or never again. You know, those things we say to God to try to, to get him to say, okay, fine. Just like the kid in the shopping cart. Oh, please, ask me for a piece of candy. I won't say anything else. I won't, you know. Oh, fine. You know. We've all done it, even though we know that's not the right way to parent. <laughs> Crystal more than others. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I love your giggle. <laughs> I remember hearing a story one time of a woman buying a cake, and it had a cherry on top. And she told the baker, take the, take the cherry off. And the baker was like, why? Unless you can split it five ways, take the cherry off. <laughs> but I think it's foolish, honestly, to think that God needs our negotiations in that way. I, I think we negotiate with God and we, we, we bring what we think we have to the table for God because we think God needs some sort of incentive to bless our lives. And that's just kind of a weird thing, you know, to think that God needs anything for me. Or that God would be satisfied to take pain from my child and then give it to me and that's going to be okay with him. No, I, I think honestly that we have to come from that perspective. We have to understand that God is, first of all, he's a good God, right? He loves us. Just like we love our children, we want to bless our children. And I, I live kind of in that place, and I have for, for, I guess, probably, I'd say since 2006 or so, where the Lord kind of drove it into my head. So the last six years, I've kind of understood and kind of lived with that perspective that I think God wants to bless my life. I, think, I honestly think God wants to bless me. He seeks for opportunities to bless me. Where in the past, maybe I thought, you know, well, God maybe is disappointed in me, or maybe God doesn't want to bless me, or, you know, I made all these problems, and I, I caused this, these issues for myself, and so, you know, I have to suffer the consequences. When in reality, God's just saying, hey, I want you to come to me. Admit your faults, sure. Confess your sin. But open yourself up for blessing. Believe that I love you enough that I want to bless your life. That's hard for us sometimes. What's, what's odd about it is that we'll go to Jesus to ask for forgiveness of sin, and we know there's nothing we can do to earn that, and he, he wipes out all of our sin, and he forgives us, and yet then I make a mistake after that, and I think, well, God's not going to forgive that. <coughs> odd, don't you think? And I guess that's just human nature. But I think sometimes... We don't get anything from God. I, I think sometimes we miss out on the abundant life because we're just not willing really to go in the first place. We're not really willing to spend the time to press in, to, to humble ourselves before the Lord. And, and we think that we only can get blessings from God when we deserve it. But let me give you a newsflash, guys. This is the, this is the truth. You never, you never, you never deserve it. It's a mistake we make is to think at times that we are good, that we are worthy, that I have been good enough to merit God's favor, and the truth is, is we're never good enough. 
and yet he still wants to bless us. And, and, and he wants us to live an abundant life, and I've experienced that in my life, an abundant life. Now, I told the story about my house, you know, and, and all those things, but I'm not talking about that, I, and, and I want to be very careful about this, because I think a lot of people go to that place of, of prosperity, that prosperity, you know, not a prosperity gospel, that if you do the right things, then God will bless you with abundant things and, and all of that. And, and I, don't, I don't say that God won't sometimes bless you materially, because he does. But the reality is, and if you've lived long enough, you know, material possessions do not satisfy. And so if all you have is money and possessions, then you'll find yourself very miserable. But what God means when he says, I'm going to give you an abundant life, is this. In his presence is fullness of joy, right? At his right hand, pleasures forevermore. Um, God is the thing that satisfies our life. And outside of him, there is nothing that satisfies. And so it's going to him for this desperate need, and oftentimes he allows a desperate need in my life, which causes me to break and finally go to God and say, God, I need your help. That helps us to come to him and realize that, man, he is really what I was yearning for deep inside that I didn't even realize I was yearning for. I love what Corey Ten Boone said. She said that you'll never know that God is all you need until God is all you have. And I don't think any of us are naive enough to, to believe that this luxury and prosperity that this country is experiencing, and, and not so much as before, but still experiencing, is something that is a right of ours or that is going to continue on without any hiccup. I think we're all aware of history and we see how Germany was in great prosperity during the 20s and then in the 30s they crashed hard and, and that was when Hitler was able to come in after, you know, 700,000 marks became worth a loaf of bread in one day. It went from being like a million dollars to being not enough to buy a loaf of bread in one day. We know that could happen to us. And yet for the Christian Jesus is our possession. He is the thing that we yearn for. Just like Tozer would tell us in his book, Pursuit of God, the blessedness of possessing nothing. He's, he's saying that you don't know in your life how unvaluable life is until you've experienced who God is. I know this is kind of a long introduction, but I kind of wanted to, to bring this up because this is kind of our example today of somebody who finds himself in desperation and yet goes to the right source. They go to the place where they need to go. Let's look at verse 24. It says, From there he arose, Jesus, he arose and went to the region of Tyre and Sidon, and he entered a house and wanted, to, wanted no one to know it, but he could not be hidden. For a woman whose young daughter had an unclean spirit heard about him, and she came and fell at his feet. The woman was Greek, a Syrophoenician by birth, and she kept asking him to cast the demon out of her daughter. But Jesus said to her, Let the children be filled first, for it is not good to take the children's bread and throw it to the little dogs. And, he answered and, and she answered and said to him, Yes, Lord. Yet even the little dogs under the table eat from the children's crumbs. Then he said to her, For this saying, your, go your way. The demon has gone out of your daughter. And she had, and she had come into the house. She found the demon gone and her daughter lying on the bed. This is a, an amazing passage, you know, and as we've been going through, we've been talking about the authentic Jesus. Um, who is the true Jesus? And, and as we think about who Jesus is, this may be a stark contrast in the way that this passage unravels. It may be a stark contrast with, uh, uh, from who we think Jesus is. I mean, he seems, here he seems rude. He seems uncaring and loving. He seems prejudiced. You know, he compares this woman to a little dog. Acts like she's not worth his time because she's not the chosen people. And yet I think as we look at this, we see an example of Jesus who, and, and I think um, we see a, an example of Jesus who desires for people to press into him. A Jesus who desires his children 
to live by faith and to act in faith in their relationship with him. And, and that's exactly what we're seeing here, even though Jesus seems completely um, callous towards this woman. He, he's actually, um, I don't know, it's almost like they're playing a game with each other. It's like he's testing her resolve and, and she's not going to let go until she gets what she wants. Meanwhile, as the disciples are watching on, you know, it's kind of interesting to see their reaction to this whole thing. Let's take a look at verse 24. It says, From there he arose and went to the region of Tyre and Sidon, and he entered a house and wanted no one to know it, but he could not be hidden. So now Jesus, he's leaving on foot from Galilee. Um, he's been around the Mediterranean Sea. He's confronted there by um, the Pharisees and the scribes. And remember, they, they accuse his disciples of eating without washing their hands. And, you know, and that's, we can understand that in our culture, can't we? You know, eating without washing your hands. What do you think? I mean, you're disgusting. You're going to spread germs and disease. And, you know, we, we get that. But we don't get it in the way that they do. See, they weren't really washing their hands. They were just kind of doing a ceremony. And they thought that all these outward ceremonies made them right before God, and Jesus kind of turns that whole idea on its head. And, and they're just blown away by the things Jesus said, but it was just more ammunition for those scribes and Pharisees who desired to put Jesus to death. And in their mind, and in their culture, not washing your hands in the way that ceremonially you were supposed to, eggshell water down this way, and eggshell water down that way, and eggshell water down that way. And all the ceremony that they did to wash their hands ceremonially was punishable by death. So this is a serious issue. And so what does Jesus do? Jesus takes his disciples and they go 12 miles, or excuse me, 70 miles, 12 disciples and go 70 miles up to Tyre side. What is today current Phoenicia? Or Lebanon, actually Le Lebanon today, and back in those days, the land of Phoenicia. And, and Jesus takes them there, and it says that as they got there, they entered into a house and wanted no one to know it. <laughs> this is interesting. Jesus, I think, when he's telling his disciples, well, we want to go up there, we're going to kind of hide out for a little while until things kind of blow over, maybe, with as angry as the scribes and the Pharisees are. We're going to just kind of go up there and hang out for a little while. Don't want anybody to know where we're going, so we're going to go way up into Phoenicia. Um, didn't want anybody to know it. Now, this is kind of a weird thing, because Jesus is going to a place where Jews would not go. I mean, we're talking about a place of utter, complete depravity and debauchery. In Phoenicia, in, in Tyre and Sidon, those areas, they, they practice abortion post-birth. That was one of the things that they did. They take the babies, after they were born, they'd lay them on the arms of a red-hot, molten god, and the babies would roll off into the mouth of this awful thing called mullet. And it was for prosperity, and you know, we want to prosper, so we're going to offer our baby, you know, we're much more sanitized than that, aren't we, in our culture? But is it any better? No, it's not. Homosexual, homosexuality was rampant. In fact, um, the, up in Tyre and Sidon, they practiced um, sexual rights for, um, for their worship. If you were a priest or, or a priestess, you would be in the temple there of Ashtar, and somebody would come to worship, they would actually, you were you know, a temple prostitute. And that was part of the way that they worshipped their gods, was through sexual activities, you know, and, and homosexual activities. And all, all this stuff was going on, so we, you know, we're talking about a, a society that's overrun with homosexuality, venereal diseases, a society who's murdering their babies. You know, a society, and we think about that, we can understand these Jews as they would have to travel through Phoenicia, they would leave and they'd get to the edge of the promised land, they would dust themselves off and get the dust off their feet because they don't want that disgusting, dirty, pagan dirt on their clothes when they entered into the promised land. They would never go there, oh my goodness. I mean, it would be the last place you'd want to travel, this horrid place. And yet, where does Jesus go? 
I think it's kind of interesting. Jesus goes right into the midst of these people and enters into a house, enters into somebody's house, a Phoenician's house. I think it's interesting as we think about culture today, we get upset about a lot of different things, don't we, as Christians. The world sees us and they say, oh, those are the guys who are offended by everything. They're offended by homosexuals, they're offended by homosexual marriage, they're offended by abortion, they're offended by all this stuff. It's kind of an interesting thing because the people who do those things are not believers, are they? They're not believers. And yet we want them to act how? Like believers? I don't expect my dog to eat at the table. She's a dog. She eats on the floor because she's a dog. And I think that it's interesting that Jesus would go up to this place and he would inter intermingle with these people and he would... What, what was he there? What was his purpose there? To change the laws so they couldn't have Molech? No, he was there to seek and save that which was lost. His purpose was to share the gospel, not to try to get laws passed so that non-believers can't act like non-believers. Not to, you know, none of those things. I mean, you just don't see that in the Word. What we see is Jesus trying to seek people to find them so that they can be saved. You know, trying to get people not to have abortions or people to stop acting like, like non-believers. You know, they're non-believers. How do we expect them to act, right? It worries me sometimes because I see the church crossing over into an area politically where we think that we need to control the culture and make the culture Christian. How do we make a culture Christian? We share the gospel. People need to be saved. They don't need to be told, you can't you know, do this or you can't do that. It's, it doesn't help anything. You know, and I love that Jesus would go to Syrophoenicia. I love that he would enter into a house there. And this is kind of an interesting thing. We think about entering, Jesus entering your house. You know, did he rent the house? Was it somebody who was kind of a familiar with his ministry, you know. It's, it's interesting, Jesus enters this house um, of these people because um, that's what they did in those days. That's what they do still in the Middle East today. Do you know that you could take your family, your kids, you could go somewhere in the Middle East, you could knock on a random door and say, hey, it's my wife and me and my kids, you know, we're looking for somewhere to stay. You know what they would say? Come on in! Stay as long as you want! They'd keep you there for a month if you wanted. They'd be sad if you left. That's just the way the culture is. You know, it's really bizarre. You know, actually, they've kind of discovered, you know, through modern anthropology, actually, that in warmer cultures, warmer climate cultures, warmer climate cultures, that's the way people are. You know, you, you go, like if you were in Mexico, you could just knock on somebody's house and say, hey, can I stay with you for a while? They'd be like, sure. And let you in and feed you tacos and burritos and fatten you up and let you stay as long as you want. Because that's, that's the culture. It's a warm culture. In cold cultures, you know, where the climate's colder, people tend to be more respectful of people's time, people's privacy. You know, and I don't know what the difference is, but they've just kind of separated it into those two things. I think both have their benefits, right? But that's why when people fly to America and they have no money, have you heard of this? They have no money, they put them on the plane and send them back home. Why would anybody come here with no money? I'll just stay with somebody. I'll just knock on somebody's door. How would you feel if somebody came to your door and said, choo, choo, choo. Hey, it's me and my family, um, we're just new in town, can we stay with you? It would solve the homeless problem, wouldn't it? <laughs> what would you say? Uh, you're weird, you know? <laughs> I'll buy you a motel room. I don't want you with my family. You know, it's, it's just a different idea of, of the way things work. You know, that's why it says in, um, I can't remember actually where it says, but you know that verse, I think it's Peter said it. You know, um, some have entertained angels unaware. You know, be, be careful to entertain strangers because some have entertained angels unaware. Because that's the way it worked. You know, you just knock on somebody's house. Some people were too proud to do that, so they'd be in the open square. But we see examples of that where people actually saw them in the open square and said, hey, come home with me. And then they would protect them over the safety of their own family. And that's just the way that that culture worked. 
And so probably Jesus and his disciples, you know, just went up to somebody's house and knocked on the door and said, uh, hey, it's me and, and these 12 guys. Um, we need somewhere to stay tonight. And somebody said, oh, good, come in, you know, and take care of them. You know, that's just the way that that works. It's some random house. It very well could have been. But Jesus goes in there and he's, he's trying to be secretive. Trying to be secretive. Doesn't want the Pharisees and the scribes for sure to know he's there. But I believe that Jesus knows that he's going to have a specific visitor. Even though he acts annoyed, even though he acts really indifferent towards her, um, he knows, just like he knew that there was going to be a woman at the well in Samaria or that Nicodemus was going to come to him at nine. And so it says, verse 25, notice, for a woman whose da young daughter had an unclean spirit heard about him, and she came and fell at his feet. And this is interesting. This story um, you should have some familiarity to us. You know, Jesus going up to um, this region where they worship Baal and Ashtoreth and, you know, depravity. And, you know, it's where Jezebel was from. Kind of gives you an idea of what it was like in Phoenicia. And, and yet, this was the same place that God would send Elijah. Remember that? Elijah was by the brook Cherith, and the, it dried up, and the ravens stopped bringing food. And so he, he's, you know, wondering what's coming next. And God speaks to him and says, I want you to go find this widow up in Phoenicia. And so he goes, and he finds this widow. He's probably thinking, oh, this wealthy widow's going to take care of me while the drought's happening. He finds this woman. She's gathering some sticks. She's going to make a fire so that she can bake a piece of bread with her last little bit of flour and her last little bit of oil, and then her and her son are going to eat it, and then they're just going to die. Kind of their last meal. And Elijah says, make some for me first. <laughs> then you can make your own and die. And she did. But then he basically tells her, you know, God's going to multiply. You know, and he did. He multiplied the flour and the oil through the entire three and a half years famine. And she survived. A Phoenician woman. A pagan idolatrous Phoenician woman. And God would use her to, to provide for his, his prophet. And, and it, kind of some similarities here. Elijah was going there to kind of hide from Jezebel, the leaders in Israel that were corrupt. Jesus is going there to kind of hide from the scribes and the Pharisees, the leaders in Israel who were corrupt. They both meet a Phoenician woman who is, is caring or desperate for the welfare of her child. And in both cases, God provides a miracle to supply the need in this case. I love this because um, it tells us in Matthew 15 that the disciples came and urged Jesus to send her away. <laughs> These guys are always sending people away. You guys notice that? You go to the, you know, Jesus says, get in the boat, let's go to the other side and rest. And they get in the boat, you go to the other side, 5,000 people show up. What did the disciples say about those people? Lord, send them away. Now this woman comes, and they feel more justified because she is a Gentile dog, which is what the Jews called the Gentiles. Who are Gentiles? We are. That's right. That's us, right? We're the Gentiles. We're the Jews called people who were not Jewish dogs. That's, they didn't have swear words back in those days. And so they just called them a, you know, a dead dog's head or a dog or whatever. You know, that's the stuff that, you know, if you weren't as worthless as a dead dog's head, then they'd just call you a dog. You know, and, and the idea was a scavenger dog. And so these guys weren't, weren't at all um, concerned about this woman. They're just, send her away. She's bothering us. Send her away. And yet Jesus doesn't. He, he's not that way. It's interesting. Um, it says, verse 26, the woman was a Greek, a Syrophoenician by birth, and she kept asking him to cast the demon out of her daughter. Matthew says this in verse 15, chapter 15, verse 22, he says, And behold, a woman of Canaan, so she was a Canaanite Syrophoenician, um, came from the region and cried aloud, saying, Have mercy on me, O Lord, son of David, my daughter is severely being possessed. But he answered her not a word. And this is one of my favorite exchanges in the Bible. I just love this. You know, you think of somebody being rude to somebody, you know, and that's, that's awful. You know, it's like, um, 
you know, you, you can love somebody and do good for them, but the opposite of that is being mean to them. Actually, the opposite of, of love is, is indifference, isn't it? I'm not even going to acknowledge you. And that's what Jesus is doing. He is completely ignoring her. She's, she's crying out to him. She's pleading with him again and again and again. It says in Mark, she keeps asking for him to help her. And he is just shining her on. He's not even looking at her, not acknowledging her. And that's when his disciples say, Lord, just send her away. And then he turns to his disciples in Matthew chapter 15. He, he goes on to say to them, to the disciples, not to her, to, to them, I was not sent except to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. So it's almost like he's feeding this, you know, patriotism of Israel in their heart and, and the, the disdain for this woman who is not them. This feeds that within his that feeling of superiority in his disciples. But at this point, Matthew tells us in verse 25, 15, 25, then she came and worshipped him, saying, Lord, help me. So what's amazing about this is here's a Syrophoenician woman. She is a pagan. She's a worshipper of Ashtoreth, probably, of Baal. Who knows what kind of things she's done. And if the things that she's done in terms of her pagan worship and disgusting things that she's done are, are not the reason why her daughter is demon-possessed. It's very possible that she's the cause of that. And, and yet, she, she, in a way, maybe trying to butter him up, she's calling him Son of David. She's using these messianic titles to say, I know that you're the Jewish Messiah, you're the Son of David. And then she calls him Lord, um, Kyrios, in the Greek meaning the Lord. And bows down to him, worshiping him, saying, Lord, help me. Completely humbling herself after he's completely ignored her. Spurgeon, in his commentary on this, says that she is a jewel of faith for all to see. And likens her to Jacob. Now, what's amazing to me, I, I love the story of Jacob in the Old Testament because Jacob was a scoundrel. I mean, his name means heel catcher. It means to trip somebody up. You know, he was a scoundrel. And you look at his life and you see how he um, took advantage of his brother Esau at every turn, right? Getting him to sell his birthright for a bowl of soup and then stealing his blessing by pretending to be him in front of Isaac, deceiving his father, ripping his brother off, and finally, he's burned enough bridges and caused enough problems that he flees from that location. He finds himself um, with his, you know, over in Mesopotamia with Laban, his uncle. And with Laban, his uncle, he works for him for all these years to, to win the hands of his daughters. And he finally does. But he also burns bridges there and, and kind of manipulates the circumstance. He's always looking for an angle to the point where he has to kind of run for his life as Laban, um, you know, wasn't going to let him go. He finally leaves and then God intervenes and keeps Laban from killing Jacob. He's burning all these bridges, but now he's burnt bridges here, he's burnt bridges there, and now he has to go home to face his brother Esau. So his brother Esau sends a party out and says, hey, I'm going to come and greet you. <laughs> So what does Jacob do? He, he splits his whole family, the servants, and, and into two companies. He puts the least important kids up front, you know, the ones that are expendable. And then he puts the next important group of people behind them. So he's like Bilhah and his other wife, and he put those kids out front, and then put his Leah, you know, in front of them, and then his favorite wife and his favorite kids, Rachel and um, Joseph, back with him. That way, if they all get slaughtered, we got a chance to escape. And so even as they're camping, here's Esau's coming. And as Esau's coming, then these two camps are kind of set up, one to take the majority of the buffer, and the second one to kind of give them a chance to escape. They, they, he backs off and he pulls just him and Rachel and the kids beyond the river, so they have the advantage to escape. And, and, and as messed up as that guy was, as messed up, as all that is, and you think about it, God meets him there. And God wrestles with him. And if I was God, I'd want to wrestle with him. 
And he's wrestling God, and, he's, and he realizes, as he's wrestling this man, and all of a sudden he realizes, this is God. And so what does he do? He clings to him. And, and God says, okay, it's, day's breaking, it's time, you're done. He's like, no, I'm not going to let go until you bless me. I'm not going to let go until you bless me. And he held on to God until he got his blessing. And so to this woman, she is not going to give up. Everything is at stake for her. Her daughter is in a, in a place where she cannot be anymore. And she's not going to give up until she gets what she wants. She sees Jesus as the only hope. Verse 27, it says, But Jesus said to her, Let the, let the children be filled first, for it's not good to take the children's bread and throw it to the little dogs. Is Jesus calling her a little dog? Here? Is he calling her a dog? You know, he, what Jesus is doing is he's using a diminutive in the Greek, which is what he's doing. He's taking a popular theme and he's reducing it, kind of softening it. Now, normally Gentiles were called scavenger dogs. That's what they called them commonly. She knew that. She'd been around Jews. She'd seen that. She'd been called that. But here he takes it and he doesn't call her a scavenger dog, but what he calls her is a puppy. Well, he, he likens her to a puppy. She's the puppy in the illustration anyway. You know, he isn't directly saying you're a puppy. <laughs> He's saying, you know, hey, that would be like, you know, helping you would be like giving the children's bread to the puppies. Just a little bit insulting. And I think that at this point, this woman could be like, you know what? Forget about it. And just leave and say, I don't want to deal with you anymore. You know, this is ridiculous. You treat people, you're supposed to be the Messiah and you treat people like that. And, and you know, just all this drama. And, and so, you know, she, she could have just said, you know what, forget about it. I'm, I'm out of here and jaded by Jesus, jaded by everything. And I'm just going to, you know, find somebody else to help me. But she realizes something. She realizes that Jesus is her only hope. And she also probably realized something else. Jesus, by calling her a little dog or a puppy, Jesus, by calling her a puppy, I'll dance. I mean, you can play some music for me. No, that'd be bad, huh? Um, Jesus, by calling her a puppy, has actually included her in the family. You see that? I mean, we understand that in our culture, don't we? I mean, our dogs are part of our families. You know, it's ridiculous, isn't it? I mean, it's, it's ridiculous how much they're part of our family. I mean, we, we even have little stickers that we put on the outside of our house, you know. I have a hamster, a dog, two fish. Cat. You leave the cat. <laughs> if, if my house is burning down, save my animals, you know. We have the stickers, right? You know, dogs are part of the family. That's why Jesus would say dogs. That's why Jesus didn't say cats, because cats aren't really part of the family either. Yeah. <laughs> you know that your cat, if you, have, if you are a cat person, you know that cat thinks it's a god. <laughs> and then you are its subject. I am going to step in my toilet and then step on your counters. <laughs> That's what I'm going to do. Ugh! Yuck! No, it's okay. Dogs clean the floor. That's why we buy them. They're vacuums, right? Sorry, I've gone too far already with the cat thing. Forgive me if you're a cat person. I know you are, Melissa. She has dogs too, though. Dogs are supposed to eat cats, right? <laughs> I'm sorry. Okay. Moving on. Um, <laughs> yeah. But he, he really, he's including her in the family. I think she, she picks up on that. And she's not, because of that, she's not going to give up. Notice what she says. She answered and said to him, yes, Lord, yet even the little dogs under the table eat from the children's crumbs. Now, he used a different word for children. The word he used was technon, which means um, the, the children, the biological children. But she uses a more broad word that means all the children of the household, even servants and slaves and anybody else who is part of that household. She's saying, yeah, but all the people who are eating at the table, when they drop crumbs, the dogs eat it. The little puppies eat it. She's saying, hey, I'm still part of the family. 
You see, this is the thing that she was coming to this whole thing and, and, and very humbling for her to acknowledge all of this. And yet, as I said before, before we started the study, as I was just kind of introducing this whole thing, it, it, we have to come to that place where we realize that we don't deserve anything, do we? We are the little dogs. We're barely adopted into the family, you know? It's amazing to me. We had a litter of six puppies just the last couple months ago. And, um, you know, to sell all those puppies and everything, you know, and the little boxer puppies and the people who want them. It's amazing the way that he, I mean, these dogs instantly become a part of these people's family. I mean, it is ridiculous. And I got, I get text messages of um, whatever the dog's name is and, oh, this is what, you know. I mean, just like silly stuff. Like, I want to know the personal life of this puppy that I sold to somebody. You know, and all the history and everything. You know, I've, I've made friends. You know, there's a pastor who bought one, and now we're going to go out to lunch and hang out and stuff. You know, <laughs> because we have this in common. We have kids that are related. <laughs> you know, it's just bizarre how much these become part of our family. And yet humbling for her to acknowledge that, say, yeah, you know, I'm not worthy to be more than just a little dog. And yet even the dogs get something, don't they? See, that's what Jesus was waiting for. Jesus knew that if he, if he just allowed her to press enough, that it would be such an example of faith to his disciples. I'm just a puppy under the table. That's all I am. For the record, I'm glad we got rid of those six puppies. Because one puppy is enough <laughs> for a household. For me, anyway. Anyway, verse 29. And he said to her, for this saying, go your way, the demon has gone out of your daughter. In, in, in um, Matthew chapter 15, 28, it says, And then Jesus answered and said to her, O woman, great is your faith. Let it be as you desire. And her daughter was healed from that very hour. There are only two times that Jesus marveled at somebody's faith in the entire New Testament. Only two times Jesus marveled at someone's faith. And this is kind of sad when you think about it, because you think that, Israel would be filled with people that had great faith, right? The first time was a centurion whose servant was sick. A Roman centurion, not a Jew. The second time was a Syrophoenician woman. These are the people who had great faith. Why? Well, because I think that the other people were just kind of too familiar with God. They became too familiar with God and too familiar with the way that they were worshiping God and the things that they were doing. And yet here were people who were stepping outside of their comfort zone and saying, God, you know what, I believe that you're good. And I believe that you'll come through for me. Beyond any expectation. And, and Jesus blesses both in both cases and commends them for their faith. And I think that this is a huge example for the disciples, but I think it's a huge example for us as well. Because how easy is it to think, well, I'm a Christian, so God's going to take care of me, or... You know, this is just the way that I'm going to go to church and I'm going to do my thing as a Christian. And, and, and in that attitude, never press in and say, God, I'm so far from you, I really need you. I think that just the proximity of being part of the family of faith, we can forget that we desperately need God and that by nature we are not close to Him. We don't get close to God just by attending church. We get close to God because we've seek his face and we press in and say, God, I need you to touch me. I need you to bless me. And I'm not going to let go of you until you do. I'm not going to stop praying until you do. I think of James Fraser who went to the LaSalle in China. He was, they were way up there like the Native Americans here, you know. Um, they were way up in the mountains. They lived, you know, very primitive lives, way up there in the mountains. And he climbed these mountains and he went to these people. And he was kind of callous about the, you know, they need Jesus, they don't need their demon worship. You know, the little demon shelves that they put up in their houses, they don't need that stuff. And he basically told people, you know what, accept Jesus, try Jesus out, forget about that demon shelf, take it down. And they said, oh, wait, no, you know, if we take the demon shelf down, people are going to die. Oh, that's just superstition. No, really, just take it down, see, Jesus will help you. They took it down, guess what happened? Half of them died, everybody got sick. The demons told them what they were going to do, and they did it. They, they weren't serious about their commitment to Jesus, and he wasn't serious about how important it was to make sure their commitment was serious. 
And I mean, it was spiritual warfare. He, he struggled there for 11 years seeking God to, to win these people and have very few converts for 11 years and just difficulty after difficulty after difficulty and, and to see how re, the reality of their demon worship. I mean, this is how serious it was. He recorded this uh, ritual every year. They had this big ritual where everyone would gather together and they would hear the demands of the demons. That was the thing, you know, in their culture. And if you read missionary biographies, you'll, you'll see that this is real similar something that happens around the world in places where people worship, they call it animism, but it's really just demon worship. And basically what would happen is everybody would get really drunk off rice whiskey until they were out of their minds because they knew that the demon was going to pick one of them that year. And so finally the witch doctor would say, you're the one the demon picked. And the guy would strip down naked, the demon would enter him, they would take chains from the fire, they'd take hot molten chains from the fire and lay them on his body and he would not be burned. And then they would hold razor sharp swords up in a ladder and he would walk up the sword supernaturally and stand on the top sword of the guy that was holding it and he would scream out all the demands that the demons had for that year. Serious stuff. He had no idea about the power that he was coming up against as he went to China. But after 11 years of serious prayer and, and just seeing God beginning to work, there was a breakthrough. And God began to save people. And he would go actually to a village, and he would, it would be a new village, and he would ask the chief, can I come into the village? Can I share the news about God to your people? And the chiefs would say no. So he would go up onto a hill above the village or somewhere off from the village, and he would pray fervently until he knew in the spirit that God had given him that village. And then he'd go back in, all of a sudden they'd let him in, and the whole village would get saved. Just a miraculous work. I mean, you can look it up on the LaSalle, L-A-O-S-U, or something like that, on, you know, on China, um, on YouTube, or something, or online, whatever. Google, that's what I was trying to say. And Mountain Rain is the book, if you ever want to read that book. It's an amazing, fascinating story. But he, he learned the secret of breakthrough prayer. It, it's no different for Hudson Taylor, the, the, actually the founder of the China in the Mission. He wasn't always a Christian. He grew up in a Christian home, but at, as a 14-year-old boy, he found himself um, you know, kind of jaded by the whole Christian thing, growing up in a Christian home, and really kind of disconnected from all that, thought it was kind of stupid. And one day he was home alone, his parents had gone on a vacation, he was all, all by himself, and he was in his parents' study, and he saw a little pamphlet there, a little track, on the cross of Jesus Christ. And so he picked it up and he started to read it, and all of a sudden he felt convicted in his heart. And he realized, man, I need to get right with God, and he got down on his knees and accepted the Lord. Two weeks later, his mom came home. And he says, Mom, I have to tell you what happened. And she says... Don't bother, I already know. The Lord told me two weeks ago. And he says, how do you know? And she says, the Lord put you on my heart, a strong burden for you on my heart. And I went into a room and locked myself in there. And I prayed for you until I knew that the Lord had told me that you had gotten saved. And when she stopped praying, it was the exact moment that he got saved. You see, I think that oftentimes we as Christians, we kind of ask God half-heartedly for something and, and yet <laughs> fall short in prayer. And, and it's a difficult thing for us because why does God want us to pray? I mean, that's, isn't it weird? You know, isn't prayer kind of a weird thing? God already knows what we're going to say before we ask it, so why do we have to go and pray? You know, what's the big point? Let me put that a different way. Why do I have to tell my wife I love her? I already told her when we got married. She already knows. Why do I need to tell her? It's the same thing. God needs me to pray to him because he wants a relationship with me. He wants me to depend on him. And so I go to him in prayer and I ask him, and sometimes he's, he's up there just like a parrot would be up there. You know, you know I'm, I'm, I'm enjoying you coming so much that I'm, I'm going to postpone my answer to your prayer for maybe a month or so so that you'll come every day like you've been coming. It's so wonderful. And in hopes that maybe you realize as you go day in and day out and you're like, Lord, please help me, that just being in his presence 
is what satisfies your life. In His presence is fullness of joy. And so as I'm cultivating this relationship with the Lord and I'm seeing Him answer prayer and I continue to go and I keep asking and He keeps blessing and I go and praise and He continues to cultivate that relationship with me, I find that in my life I am fulfilled. I can't wait for the next problem to arise so that I can go to the Lord. I can count it all joy when I face various trials because the testing of my faith is producing patience in my life and I'm able to go to the Lord and say, Lord, I need that. I need you to touch me once again. You see, this woman understood that she needed Jesus and that he was the only thing that was going to satisfy her. He was the only thing that was going to help her situation. It says in verse 30, And when she had come to her house, she found the demon gone, her daughter lying on the bed. <coughs> what demon is tormenting your life? What problem, what mountain are you facing? What giant is standing in the field taunting you? What's going on? What is it? Is it a financial thing? Is it a relationship thing? What, what, what is it that's, that's causing you the stress in your life? Maybe it's your son or your daughter or your wife, your health. You see, these things will come up and it's common to everyone. Everyone goes through things like this. Everyone faces trials. It doesn't matter if you're rich or poor or healthy or sick. It doesn't matter. We're all going to face new trials. And yet, are we going to take them to the Lord? I think of that song, What a Friend We Have in Jesus, where it says, Oh, what needless pain we suffer, or whatever, all because we don't take, I don't know, words to it. <laughs> Trying to sound poetic. Because we don't take everything to God in prayer. What burdens we carry what needless pain we bear all because we do not carry everything to God in prayer. Something like that. It's so true. And I don't know where you're at this morning. I don't know what you're struggling with. But Jesus has the solution. In fact, he is the only solution. And so what's the next step? The next step is to seek him, to bow down before him, to worship him, to cling to him, until he blesses, until he answers. Amen. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for your word. Lord, just the example of this jewel, this Syrophoenician woman who is just an example to us of perseverance. Lord, even when you seem like you're not listening, even when you seem distant, Lord, you're still listening. You're desiring for us to press in. You're desiring for us to drop close to humble ourselves. And I pray, Lord, that whatever it might be in our lives, that we would see you as the solution. That we would come to you. That we would cling to you. We love you and praise you in Jesus' name. Peace out.